Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And Scarlett, we have a big, big week ahead of us. Right. You've got earnings, you've got the Fed, you've got the Treasury quarterly refund, refinancing agreement. And you also have job side. Oh, yeah. At the end of the week. At the end oh of the week. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be fun. Buckle up. And let's right now get to the biggest stories in the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry. And we start with ESG. As we know, it did not get a lot of love in 2023, but with some record outflows, maybe we're starting to finally see a new leap this year. Plus, we'll keep the energy going when we speak with Tim Rotolo of Range Fund Holdings on his newly launched commodity ETFs. And in just a few moments, we're going to speak with Douglas Bonaparte. He is president of Bonafide Wealth. Uh, we're going to talk about issues including Bitcoin ETFs and rates. And this is really exciting because he's a social media celebrity. Scarlett, I am so excited to find out if he's a real person. But before we do that, as always, we have Eric Baltunas from Bloomberg Intelligence here with us now looking at the flows. Eric, what do you got? Thank you, Katie. Scarlett, yes, a lot of stuff coming out this week. But I got to tell you, investors feeling really good, at least according to ETF flows. SPY at the top is really interesting. Remember, SPY was supposed to bleed all, all January because of the tax loss harvesting outflows that came in in December. You can see the year-to-date is $17 billion negative, but it's taken in money. That's a good sign. That tells you the trading crowd actually liking the market. IVE, this is a value ETF. BlackRock's models rotate, and every time they do, the tickers go up to the top or bottom of the list. That BlackRock likes value. That other one below it, DYNF, is a multi-factor ETF. Multi-factor tensile a little value-ish. And look, that thing went from 40 million to 2.4 billion just because of BlackRock's model. Uh, that's how big those models are. And then look at the bottom here, you got IUSB. Corporate bonds taking in cash now, treasuries nothing. Nobody cares for three months. Total reversal from last year. And then you got two Bitcoin ETFs on the uh, number seven and number uh, 10. Hanging on the one week flow list, they continue taking money. Let's look at the outflows. Um, you can top of the list, you're gonna see Qual, that's part of the BlackRock rotation. They went out of quality and out of ESGU, which is on number 11, and into value, right? So GBTC, again, that is the other side to the Bitcoin ETF inflows is people got unlocked uh, GBTC when it converted to an ETF. So people leaving that, uh, and then you got a floating rate ETF in there. Rates are gonna be a big story, and USMV minimum vol, BlackRock out of minimum vol as well. Let's look at the Bitcoin ETF race, since um, it's still kind of front of mind. It's in week three this week, and after two weeks, we have two clear front runners, which would be BlackRock and Fidelity. They are neck and neck right around $2 billion, which again is a ridiculous amount of money for two weeks. That's top 1% among all new ETF launches ever, right? Then for third, you've got a real race here between ARK and Bitwise, over half a billion. And again, that was a little unexpected. We thought one might get like $2 billion and the rest would like be you know, more middle class-ish, but you're seeing there is a strong uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in almost six of them. And even the ones down here, again, 23, 50 million for a new launch is pretty incredible. But again, we're all also working with those GBTC outflows. So net, net, still inflows, barely hanging on. But for the ones that are, you know, not GBTC, it's looking pretty good so far. Absolutely, of course, a big bid for the big boys, of course. But as Eric laid out, it's not just Fidelity and BlackRock. So let's keep this conversation going now with Douglas Bonaparte. He is president at Bonafide Wealth. He's also a financial advisor, which is exciting because uh, we don't get a chance to speak to too many financial advisors. And let's talk about the spot Bitcoin ETF community, if you want to talk, uh, if you want to call it that. We saw, what, 10, 11 launch at once. What does your due diligence process look like? How did you actually pick just one? Yeah, so the first thing I usually go for, let's take a look at fees. You know, what are my clients going to pay in order to hold any product? That's number one. And then we want to see the actual reputation of the shop itself. And you got some big boys in here, right? You got BlackRock, Fidelity. You got some players who've been around in the crypto space a while. Uh, give uh, Bitwise a lot of credit here. But it's a very long list. I mean, asking advisors to do their due diligence down 11 at the beginning is quite a task for how much are we going to really be allocating in a client's portfolio here? So I wouldn't be surprised if most most advisors who are going to allocate are going to go with the top of the top of the chain, right? That's the fidelity and that's the black the black rock. And once advisors start offering it as part of their portfolios, which asset class or classes have to make room for the Bitcoin ETF? That is such an awesome question. I think it's really going to come down to the advisor and the client here. If you're me, I mean, I'm looking at equities primarily. I'm not going to swap out fixed income. You're safe. More risk off asset classes to go put into something that's obviously as volatile as uh, Bitcoin. So you're looking at large cap equities. You're looking at 
at international uh, developed. Uh, that's at least where I'm looking when you know thinking about a 5% allocation to a Bitcoin ETF. You got the S&P 500 and you got maybe a developed international fund in there. Those are your biggest positions too. So you have the most to draw against. Let's talk about your clients. So the, these, the big question is, are the boomers going to buy this? So my mom was over Sunday night. She calls Bitcoin funny money in space. <laughs> that's her description of it. But she says, I didn't look at it before because the SEC didn't approve. Now that they have said it's OK, I might look at it. BlackRock's involved. Mm -hmm. Do you find that some of your clients, this has changed the game? Are you getting inbound calls? Are you having more conversations about it? Yeah, I didn't expect a lot of inbound calls. I definitely wanted to see a handful of people, particularly baby boomers, who had no interest in moving money to an exchange to buy cryptocurrency to get uh, a position there. Um, I mostly work with mid to late 30-something-year-olds, and we've been having conversations and educational conversations around uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin well before there was a product offering. It was always my obligation to educate my clients. Putting them in something is a different story altogether, but now we have this green light, so to speak, from the SEC to allocate. So uh, my expectations were pretty low in terms of the inbound calls I would receive because most of my clients, if they were interested, they've, they've been playing the game a long time, and they're probably not going to go off an exchange or move uh, Bitcoin off a ledger and buy an ETF instead. Let's talk a little bit more about the allocation process and the due diligence mm -hmm. process because, like you said, it's fees that you're looking at. But you also drew a distinction between traditional finance companies, BlackRock, Fidelity, and maybe some of the crypto natives, if you want to sure. call them that, such as Bitwise. And when you talk to these crypto native issuers, they say that that's their selling point, yeah. that they're involved in this industry. They've been involved for a long time, and that's why people should go with them versus maybe a trusted uh, TradFi organization. Sure. How much stock do you put in that argument? I think there are some merits that I could give to a bit wise. For example, they're giving money to developers and actually helping proliferate, you know, crypto, you know, ecosystem. Um, if you're a believer in, you know, all things blockchain and, and crypto, then this is certainly, you know, something that might catch your attention and might want to have you allocate to them versus a main player. Also, the fact that they are a native, you know, this is still new technology. This is something that do they have an edge over the, you know, massive shop that is a BlackRock or a Fidelity? And I, I know their crypto desks are pretty robust and they have a lot of smart people there just the same. So. We're going to find out if it makes sense to you know, choose a native versus one of the big players. And how do you explain the purpose of this, right? And I, I deal with this on Twitter all the time. There's definitely people who look at Bitcoin as like the currency that's going to be left when society collapses and it looks like Mad Max out there. <laughs> now, when you talk to boomers, though, I'm not sure that's going to resonate versus, yeah. oh, it's a new digital goal. That's how Larry Fink positions it. How do you talk to them about this? Do you go as far as like, hey, this is a hedge against like the collapse of society? Or are you more just like, hey, look, it's a little hot sauce. It's an interesting currency. A lot of smart people are involved. Like, how do you uh, talk about it? Yeah, I think two things can be true here, right? I do view it in its most simplistic form as digital gold, as a digital store of value. Now, granted, store of value and the price action of Bitcoin might not go hand in hand. But also, you know, the room for alternative investments in a portfolio, I think clients are always seeking for things that aren't, you know, correlated or have the ability to produce alpha, you know, to a degree. These are things that clients will always have, you know, some appetite for. So these two things like, hey, new asset class, can I, you know, partake in this, maybe knock the FOMO out of the system? And will this actually add value to my long term investment strategy? I want to broaden out our conversation here and talk a little bit about equities overall, sure. uh, big cap names in particular, because five of them, magnificent seven names, report this week. And of course, tech has continued to uh, be the winners of this stock market. Do you go straight for QQQs? Do you stay with that, or do you want to broaden things out and stay with the S&P 500 through SPY? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I, I look at clients who work for these companies, and they have plenty of exposure through their incentives, and that's a different conversation for them. They probably have, you know, concentration risk within those positions. Um, for clients who are feeling more risky and want to have that exposure, QQQ is really the best way to go about it. I don't think anyone's been disappointed if they've uh, had an outsized position to that ETF last year. You know, you crushed the S&P. P500. Um, so rarely do I find myself buying individual uh, equities. You still have to choose amongst, you know, is it Microsoft that's going to be better than Google, better than, you know, Netflix or NVIDIA? And talking NVIDIA, you know, it just 
crushes everything here. QQQ is going to give you that exposure here. Um, as vanilla as they come. We want broad <laughs> exposure that we can stick with for the long term. People are going to get very excited when one issue runs or doesn't do what it, 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 you know, what they want it to do. Like, why didn't I go 5X on my tech stock? Well, like 2021 and last year aren't necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, normal when we think about how performance usually uh, goes with uh, positions like these. And before we let you go, if you're as vanilla as they come, should we talk about bonds? How are you talking yeah. to your clients about bonds? What do they want to know about bonds? Bonds have been uh, pretty weird over the past year or so. They really have. Um, you know, rarely do we make calls or get as tactical as what I'm about to share with you. But I took the Fed at their word that they were going to raise rates aggressively uh, over the last 18 months up until the point that we're at right now. Um, it turned out to be a good call. So you went short duration or stable you didn't value there. The Fed. Don't fight the Fed. I mean, wow. it's pretty much just a classic thing to do. I'm going to write uh, that down. That's yeah, okay. don't fight the Fed. <laughs> Quote Doug Bonaparte. Um, <laughs> with that being said, uh, you, you got to get it right twice, right? You can't just say, hey, we got it here on the front end. Now we got to take the Fed at their word that they're going to cut rates later this mm -hmm. year. So you got to rotate out of that short duration into the long duration stuff if that's what you believe. And we're in the process of doing that or have been doing that. So, you know, Godspeed to us. Hope we get that call right. But I think bonds overall are attractive. Very rarely do we find an opportunity to get appreciation and stability right. in one asset class. So, hey, let's look at fixed income. I mean, geez, here's a millennial financial advisor talking about <laughs> fixed income like that. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Uh, this was great. Hope you come back soon. That, of course, is Douglas Bonaparte of Bonafide Wealth. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF brief where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with the quiet, heavy hands of model portfolios. Of course, BlackRock tweaking their model portfolio allocation. They're going from growth into value. You're taking a look at uh, IVE on the top there. That's their value fund taking in a ton of money. So too is DYNF, as Eric walked us through a little bit earlier. That is their factor rotation fund, so concentrating their factor bets. So that's what's going on in model portfolios. Let's talk about something fun. Let's talk about the, those Jim Cramer ETFs. Bad news, uh, they are both shut down, of course. The long Jim Cramer ETF shut down a couple months ago, and we learned last week that the short Jim Cramer ETF is also going to close its doors. So that was a fun era, but it's over now. Let's also talk about ESG. Of course, we saw record ESG outflows last year, and what's interesting is that it was driven by just a few funds. As you can see there, Scarlett, ESGU is up at the top, losing eight and a half billion dollars in 2023. That definitely left a mark. Yeah, huge, huge differential between that and the second runner up. Uh, let's talk about this issue more with Shaheen Contractor of Bloomberg Intelligence. Shaheen, you look at that chart, ESGU losing eight and a half billion dollars uh, over 2023. Why ESGU? Scarlett, it's likely ESGU came out of model portfolio, so it automatically saw that allocation come out. The real question is, was it due to ESG or was it due to just allocative changes? I think that's up for speculation. What I always say is, if the money comes back in, I think it was just allocative. But if it never comes back in, it's probably, it's probably ESG. And we're getting to a point where it's not coming in. So, <laughs> Well, to your point on model portfolios, I mean, we just saw that with some of these uh, value and these quality funds as well. So we saw what it looked like on record outflows, of course, that it was just a few funds really driving everything. If the tables did turn and we saw big, big inflows, do you think it would be a similar dynamic where it's just a handful? Oh, yes. We saw that last year as well. So the other two funds that actually saw outflows were ESG funds, but they got reallocated into climate. So it's sort of net positive, but it's, you know, these two climate funds seeing $4 billion in inflows. You know, the start of the calendar year shows something a little bit different because ESG ETF flows did turn positive in the last week, about $2.36 I know that's a far cry from what we saw in yeah. 2023, but how do you read that slight recovery in light of the big withdrawals in 2023? So we have to divide that by region. So the 2.3 billion that we saw was not U.S. domiciled. So overall, U.S. is still negative, but global is still positive. And if you slice that, it's still the same sort of trajectory. 
How going are forward. people thinking about the label of ESG? Obviously, mm. we talk about politicization all the time. It feels like the ESG label has gotten a little bit controversial, yeah. if you want to call it that. I think it's becoming more and more controversial. I think my take is what we're doing is not changing. Right? The underlying, you want to call it ESG, sustainable, whatever you want to call it, it's not changing. So why sort of pull our head out on the label? That's my take, at least. Yeah, maybe something more neutral, like rational sustainability has gained a lot of traction. There you go. Really well, bland and really boring. Rolls but off the tongue. Too. Maybe that's what it takes. All right, yeah. Shaheen Contractor, thank you so much. Shaheen is with Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, still ahead, we drill down into energy with Tim Rotolo of Range Fund Holdings. This is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. This is ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu along with Katie Greifeld. And Eric Falchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence back with us now for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, hit it. Katie, today we have coal. This is a brand new ETF. Uh, this is one from the Lazarus list. This was an old ETF, KOL, was out for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. It went defunct right when the ESG movement was most popular. And this one came around and said, hey, let's try this again. So this is the first coal ETF, on, the only one on the market, but not the first one. And we look here, it's um, going to be uh, new. It's just came out, 85 basis points. A little, little expensive, I think, for a, for a theme ETF, but this thing's going to have volatility, so it could have a shiny object moment. Uh, coal has been on a real run lately. And the, the pitch here is, hey, you need fossil fuels as a base load to actually do clean energy. So they're trying to work in clean energy to the pitch. Let's look at the um, cross-section of the ETF here. And a couple interesting things. First of all, it's not just US. A lot of theme ETFs go globally. Big allocation to Australia outside of the U.S. here. And also check this out. The P.E. on this thing is five. And this is after 150% return. That's how low and beaten down this area was. So if you are a value investor, that has to make your eyes pop out. Let's look at the performance of the index. Remember, the ETF just came out. So here's the index versus TAN, which is clean energy stocks, and XLE, which is energy stocks. And by the way, there's no overlap between this ETF and XLE, zero. You can see coal has just demolished oil stocks and obviously really demolished energy stocks. But you can see it's going to be a little more volatile, about twice as volatile as the S&P. So, Katie, look, this one's back from the dead. A little controversial, but those returns may uh, see it get some looks. Well, let's talk about that controversy now, because joining us to talk about this ETF is Tim Rotolo. He is the CEO and founder of Range Fund Holdings. Tim, I want to talk about the positioning of this ETF. We were just talking about how the ESG label has become a little bit p political, a little bit controversial. Can we call this an anti-ESG fund? How do you think about yourself? I, I think we really are contrarian investors. So um, <clears throat> this is not a anti-woke or political statement at all. I think we looked at the landscape of investment opportunities and said, you know, number one, you don't have any, uh, any, any ETF companies out there trying to launch a coal ETF. So we love the supply de demand dynamics of that from our perspective as issuers. Um, but at the same time, coal is not going away. Um, you need, you know, whether it's metallurgical coal for steel, or thermal coal for heating. Uh, it continues to be a significant component of electrical generation globally. And then, as Eric pointed out very astutely, these stocks are just cheap. And so, you know, as, as ETF issuers, and Eric can attest to this, you know, when we launched URNM um, under the North Shore Indices brand, a significant function of that was it was a very dislocated sector, and coal feels very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has maybe more attributes in that the companies are very profitable. They're being capital disciplined. They're returning um, uh, capital to shareholders. And so, you know, we think it aligns really nicely for a thematic ETF. And, you know, again, just the fact that most other ETF issuers are precluded because of ESG reasons or stakeholder right. reasons. Um, there's just, uh, you know, we, we, we want to run towards those opportunities. And, and that, that really kind of encapsulates the other products that we launched as well. So, Tim, I, I think when you said coal is not going away, we all wrote that down because that's such a notable thing to say in this day and age. Big picture, are you betting on energy sources changing or largely staying the same then? I think this is a bet on the status quo. Um, that's not to say that coal use will not decline over time. 
Um, but electricity demand is going to continue growing. And until we figure out how to get uh, intermittent power sources like solar and wind to, um, to, to be on all the time, you know, when the wind's not blowing and when the sun's not shining, you're going to need sources of power, whether it's coal or LNG or nuclear. And in developed nations like India and China, um, you know, coal continues to be a significant portion of their electricity demand. And so, you know, we're, we're going to make a bet that the status quo is going to, to mean, uh, just stay the way it is. Um, and there, there are other parts of the market that I think it makes a lot of sense to take a bet on, you know, there being significant shifts, like biotech is an area that we think is really attractive and has, you know, some value um, components. But, um, you know, in the energy sector, we think the world is going to continue on the same path that it's been on for, you know, many decades, which is more right. demand and, and, and more fossil fuel use. So, Tim, let's talk about the other one that's part of this new launch, Nukes, N-U-K-Z, which is a nuclear yeah. ETF. Um, you talked about URNM, which you launched four years ago. It's gone up 377%, Katie. That's triple the Qs, and we know the Qs has crushed it. So great return. Now you're coming out with this new one. I guess, you know, what's the difference if somebody knows you as the URNM guy? What is this new one, and how is it different than that one? Sure. So I think we're entering in a new phase. So very similar to the LNG story and the, the coal story around baseload power, um, well, if, if we want to see an energy transition where we use less fossil fuels, I think nuclear power is a fantastic solution. And thankfully, there's political tailwinds behind that today. We're seeing a real renaissance in nuclear power. And we wanted to provide an option for investors to be able to play nuclear power demand growth and the ecosystem around that instead of just pure uranium mining. With uranium mining, there continues to be a huge supply deficit all the demand growth for the nuclear renaissance is going to make that story really attractive. Um, so, so nothing against uranium, um, but we think that there's, uh, you, you know, there's a couple of components mm -hmm. that you don't get, right? Like the small modular reactor technologies, um, some of the services businesses right. that are going to support the nuclear renaissance, some of the new advanced fuels, and so we really wanted to take an approach that also de-emphasize the mining risk right. associated with uranium. Uh, but give give a broader swath of investors um, a way to play this nuclear renaissance. And again, you just look at the political tailwinds coming out of COP28, mm -hmm. um, you know, 20, 30 nations uh, saying that they're going to try and triple nuclear power. Well, there's a tremendous ecosystem that needs to be built up in order to allow that to occur. Right. And so that was really the, the thought process behind this product. All right, Tim, got to leave it there. Really great to get some time with you. Of course, that is Tim Rotolo of Range Fund Holdings talking about coal and nukes. And if you just can't get enough of ETFs, a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber's On Trillions. It's their podcast that covers the industry. But that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greif along with Scarlett Fu and Eric Beltrunas. And this is Bloomberg.